Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back once again, Sunday night, and Rock the Stage is back with another great show, and Remember, if you're following along on PPN, the global network of the Public Place Network, thanks for joining us. Add a comment in the sections when we do this on replay. And, of course, on YouTube, if you're here for the Sunday night premiere party, join the conversation. Join the live chat and ask your questions, share your comments and thoughts so that we get deeper and deeper into tonight's show. Let me ask you this question tonight. How would you like to have a competitive advantage over your competition? First of all, you have to realize you do have competition. You have to figure out what you're going to do. You also have customers or clients. You have to figure out how what you're going to do to serve them. But often doesn't it feel like we're throwing darts at a dartboard and we hit nothing but blanks? Wouldn't you like to change that? Wouldn't you like to be able to actually hit the mark, know that you're serving your clients and customers, and know that you have them figured out so you know what to do and how to serve them? We're going to get into that tonight. And it can be a big game changer for you and your business when you understand better how to have a competitive advantage for you and your business. Now, over the past 25 years, Dave Averin has shared his insightful lessons of competitive advantage with leaders and teams, thousands of organizations across North America and in 26 countries around the world. He's gotten around just a little bit. He's the author of seven books, including his newest book, Ridiculously Easy to Do Business With, A Practical Guide to Giving Customers What They Want, how they want it, and when they want it. And David, I'm going to have you come in before I blow that any more worse than I did. <laughs> you know, it was it's pretty wordy, isn't it? But, you know, I some say, of the you, you, titles, yeah, if, if you, you're, you're saying kind of what you've heard from others as well, like what are the what are, what are the lessons and we try and say as much as we can. But, but anyway, it's good to be here, Trigger. Nice to see you, bud. Well, nice to have you on. Finally going to get you on. Uh, again, another one of those voices of just, you speak and the people stop and look at you and go, first of all, you're a giant. Then they have to figure out what their voice came from. Do you get that a lot when you just naturally yeah. go through airports and stuff with all your traveling? You, people you know, go, was, when I when I grew up, I always had, you know, I had that, that radio voice, which is interesting because today, if you listen to commercials or things, it's pretty much the every man or every woman voice. Yeah. It's not really the broadcast kind of a thing as well. But um you know, when, when you're young and you grew up and you've got a voice like this, people are always saying, God, you should be in radio or things like that. And I did that in college. My dream was always to be the voice at the airport. Uh, the one that said, no parking in the red zone. Please. What was what was the one? Remember in the movie Airplane when it sort of went back and forth and it was joke. It's like, no, the white zone. And they're arguing <laughs> back and forth. Now it's the voice on the train. You know, now approaching Concourse A. But... Anyway, someday, you know what we can dream. That's my dream is being the voice at the airport. What 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 I would like to be is the voice of the crosswalk. You know, you hit the buttons now. I yeah. would like to sit in a crow's nest and see the crosswalk and say, no, the other crosswalk, you in the red, turn around. I would love to mess with people like that. Wouldn't that be fun? At, at some point, at some point, John, you know, my my dream has always been I, I wanted to take over when Alex Trebek passed away. They overlooked me as as the host of Jeopardy. And now I guess all I can really hope for is that when Johnny Gil Gilbert passes away, I can audition for that. And this is Jeopardy. So, <laughs> you know what? We, we can all dream. David Averin, you've had an amazing career. You have had traveled the world. You're going to go back out very soon again. So yeah. I'm going to start, just dive right into this, because I, I think you have so much to offer and say, but I do have this big question. Are customers really number one anymore? Well, I think are they, they always are. Well, yes, it has to be. What, what do they say? Nothing happens until somebody sells something. The problem is we have so many in business. We have so many competing conversations and competing challenges with with employee issues and supply chain and marketing has changed so dramatically that we get a little bit distracted. And we get a little bit dismissive when people say, for us, it's all about the customer. And then they move on to something else. It's, and it's, it's not that simple. And what's really changed, and, and I go back in my career, and I spent most of my career in marketing. 
I worked with organizations. I had a marketing firm. We helped companies differentiate themselves, craft the verbiage, the wording that helped them uh, better explain what was different and better and special about what they did. And I came to this realization, as many of us have over the last decade or so, that the drivers for the decisions we make in purchasing and contracting or hiring, what's driving those decisions has changed. Now we're in a point where we assume everybody's good because if you weren't, you'd be outed, right? On Yelp or TripAdvisor or Rotten right. Tomatoes. Everybody's good or at least good enough, right? And so my more recent research has been into how has that changed? What, what's driving our decisions? And it really is the experience that we have. And to be clear, I don't talk about customer service and we know how to be nice, but the experience is different. How simple was that? Was it complicated? Was it frustrating? Did you struggle to reach a real person because you had a simple question? And all of those things um, have are, are become the, the primary drivers for assuming you're good at what you do. Don't take your eye off the ball. And right. so that led into my work. And I speak and I consult on customer experience. And as you had mentioned at the beginning, it's it, my message today is around my new book, which is called Ridiculously Easy to Do Business With. I think that's the key differentiator today. All right. So with that, what's the biggest mistake companies, major corporation companies are making for customers' experience? Is it a similar mistake that they make over and over again, or is it 100 different mistakes? Uh, well, it's a lot of mistakes, and I, and I cover them in 28 short chapters in the book. But I think the biggest mistake is the assumption that quality is still the primary driver. Uh, and Explain that, will, that. I think people still believe that. They, they still believe that. And it's not that quality is unimportant. It's just assumed. I, I was keynoting a conference and, and the CEO went on before me and was doing the rah-rah speech for the, for the people. And, and at the very end of his speech, he says, and remember, at the end of the day, it's about quality. We will win on quality. And of course, everybody's cheering. And I sat in the back and I thought, I could not disagree more. At the end of the day, it's not about quality. Rich, at the beginning of the day, it's about quality. Quality is the entry fee. You better be good at this or the world's going to figure it out. But at the end of the day, it's about competitive advantage. It's not about what do you do well. It's what do you do better than others who do it well. As I said, we all have an assumption. Everybody's good. Who can get it to me faster? Who's going to not frustrate me? Who's going to not give me unexpected bills? And so as I go through the book, it's, it's and I'm not trying to promote the book. I'm just saying it's, I, it's sort of galvanizing all these things that I've been talking about and working with organizations, all these points of contact that cause friction, right? The big yes. buzzword. And that just means frustration. What, what's pissing us off? Because <laughs> it's, you know, you're, you're, you go somewhere and, and like at the grocery store today, there's only three words that you're guaranteed to be asked by the team at the grocery store. Three words, okay. paper or plastic. Right. Well, and in many places you got to pay for those anyway. Yes. But you know, it's it's when we're being pushed to do business the way a business wants us to, instead of legitimate choices and options. And, and grocery stores is a great example in that you go there and there there's one staff checkout lane with nine carts in line yes. and twenty seven self checkout. Yes. And they'll say, oh no no, we give you a choice. It's not a choice. It's not a choice. It's, it's social engineering. They're trying to push you to do business the way they want. And at some point, the law of diminishing return, we'll just have enough of it and we'll go somewhere else. And you know what? They're, I wouldn't assume that they're unintelligent. It's just we're kind of in the middle of a grand experiment. We are in a time right now of the most profound conveniences in history. It is a great time to be a customer. Until they don't time work. to be in business. Right. Un 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 until those conveniences stop working. Here's the convenience out. Check out for yourself. And then you have to hit the red light to buy your beer. You have to hit the red light to get a, I hit this twice, not once. Right. It's not a convenience when you have to go through all that. Yeah. Every item I put through is an unexpected item in the bagging area. <laughs> you know, but I hit, but then again, my wife loves it. She just, she cruises through that. I'm so, I'm taking my little price gun and I'm like shooting the, the staff around and they're looking at me. I'm like, this thing doesn't work, <laughs> but, but it, but it's true in B2C as well or in B2B, right? It's, how easy is it to, to reach a real person? How, how quickly are we getting that response? How simple is that process? Like, I don't expect that I can get my hair cut at four o'clock in the morning, right? We're reasonable, but I expect I can make an appointment to do so and cancel that appointment. And so there, there's so many 
great new technologies. We're learning from other industries. And so I, I'm not just a complainer, but, I, but I'm sort of that outside messenger because there's ways to do this right. So on, on the quality versus easiness, I'm thinking of a certain furniture company that they have little stickers on, says A to A, B to B, and you don't have to buy any screws or nuts. You just put it all together and it's supposedly right. quality. But when you get it home, you go, this is a piece of junk. Right. How are they getting around that, David? How are they getting around? We're selling you quality, but the minute you open up the box, you realize that's a lemon. Yeah, but it's it's about balance. Uh, and I'm all about balance and about choices. You know, one of the big words in the industry today is omni-channel. And omni-channel says, no matter how somebody wants to do business with you, let them, right? Some people may want it put together. Some people will pay less to have to do it themselves. Just give people an option. And so it, it's like when somebody had asked, asked me once if we we took PayPal or Stripe right. or Venmo or, I mean, the, the answer is yes, yes. What's the question? <laughs> I my will God, take your money. My, my God, they're trying to pay you, you know? <laughs> and so it's, it's when, you know, when companies say, no, you need to do it this way. Well, other people give us the choices. And once again, we're basically, we're, we're, uh, we're reasonable. But that's, I, I admonish companies and leaders all the time is give your people choices. Just because something worked for your company 20 years ago, God, even 10 years ago, doesn't mean that's how we do business today. So we're learning from other industries outside our own. Uh, we're, we're getting great new ideas, new technologies, but, but it's less about, and I think this is one of the most important messages for your audience. It's not about competency. It's not necessarily just about quality. It's about being preferable to the other alternatives. And that's the filter that we need to think about. Not are we good at this, right? There's so many companies, they drink the Kool-Aid, right? They, uh, and, and, you know, or, or you'll hear nonsensical things like our reputation speaks for itself. One of the most lazy sentences I've ever heard in business or retailing, you know what, you better speak for yourself and understand that it's, it's, it's not just about quality. Quality is incredibly important. It's the process. How simple is it? How complicated is it? Because you need to be not just qualified and competent or compliant if you're in like financial services. Right. You need to focus on being preferable to the other alternatives. So there is this thing about have it your way. You know, the old yeah. slogan. Yeah. Is the customer driving the bus or do we as owner operators still have the right to say, no, that's our menu. That's what we do. Oh, but I want this or I don't want this. I keep Great on question. the a la carte experience. Which one's driving it? Oh, it, it's it's all of the above. And so part of my my message, part of my lessons is that you need to come to a consensus internally, mm. right? We have freedom of choice. We don't have freedom from the consequences of the choice that we make. I'm one of these people. I'm 24 seven. Doesn't mean I'm working all the time. But if my clients overseas want to have a conversation, I'm the one doing it at two in the morning or three in the morning, every single time, because I wanna be preferable to my, my colleagues. And so make some decisions internally. I mean, people will tell me they'll disagree with something. I said, well, you don't have to agree with me, but you have to agree with each other. How so are we gonna do it? Just... No, I was gonna oh, no, say real quick. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, that is, it's, you asked the question like, who's driving it? I think yeah. we have to be very cognizant of what our customers want and how they prefer it. And then we make decisions as an organization, as a team, which are the ones are reasonable for us and which ones aren't. Uh, but we have to be far more broad than we than we were when we were rigid as a business. We can't be rigid. We have to find ways to say yes. And doesn't mean we do it unprofitably, but if there is um, if there's an outlier, if there's a request for something we normally don't do, and this this one is probably the one that it, that wakes up my clients more than anything else in yeah. my audiences, is I'll say, you know, if they want to do this, whatever else, and and the response sometimes, and it's a reasonable accommodation, we just generally don't do it. The response is always this. But the pushback I get all the time is, well, if we do it for you, we have to do it for everyone. Here's a little hint. No, you don't. You don't have to do anything for everyone. It's your business. If there's some a special accommodation that you can make, do it. Customers love that. There's a hundred times better chance of winning the business with a response within five minutes. Not a hundred percent, a hundred times better. I like the platinum rule. The platinum rule says do unto others as they would have done unto themselves. In other words, don't treat people the way you want to be treated. 
treat them like they want to be treated. And to do that, we have to understand them on a different level. Well, if I do it for you, I have to do it for everyone. And I laughed and I, and I said, no, you don't. You don't do anything for everyone. It's your business. If somebody needs to do a late checkout, and we're not doing late checkouts today, but somebody really, okay. You know, or somebody asked me, um, I was in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, and I've spoken, and I'm about to hit my 28th country, and they, they were in some financial service, and they said, but do we treat our best customers better? And I said, you have to. You, it doesn't mean that you treat other people poorly, but do your best customers get additional options? Of course, they're paying the bills. So it's a flexibility that people are not used to. Don't be lazy and say, well, we do it for them, we have to do it for them. You do whatever you want that serves your customers as long as it's reasonable and that you remain profitable. There are always going to be outliers. You fall on your sword, you make it right. Um, but, and no, not everybody gets a one-off. If you're in a manufacturing plant, you can't do custom for everyone. It's not profitable, but we have to no. do more than we have historically. So you mentioned AI a few moments ago. I want to go back to that for a second because AI is affecting everything around the world Absolutely. right now. Some people think it's the new savior of the business. Other people are thinking it's doom and gloom and others are like, I don't care. So what advantage does AI give us now? AI gives us, and when we're talking within this context, it's generally chatbots or, uh, you know, voice menus or things like that, right? It can predict yep. or maybe understand the problem and, and redirect you. Once again, it's options. There's a term in the industry called the off-ramp. And if we're yelling into the phone, real person, real person. I think you said no, no, right, right, no, agent. Um, you're frustrating your customers. You're angering your customers. I think one of the biggest challenges we have right now is call, I have such a heart for people in call centers, right? The BPOs, the business process outsourcing, the, the, the customer service line. By the time somebody gets to talk to a real person, they're often at a 12 in terms of their anger and frustration. And it's cruel. It's cruel to these customer service agents. So back to your question about AI, it's, I, I tell organizational leaders, I tell audiences that, that AI, chatbots, those kinds of, of assistants, they're not to be deployed so that you don't have to talk to your customers. They are there so that pedestrian issues can be offloaded okay. so that you have time to talk to the customers who really need it. So, you know, I've heard some of your keynotes and you talk about the power of voting with your wallet, voting with your money, voting sure. with your habits. Is that still true anymore? Because now we do online and everything else. Do, do, do yeah. we still vote with our money the way we used to? A hundred percent, but we don't do it the same way. Okay. But, but smart companies are still looking at those analytics. Um, one of the, the biggest uh, I, I think indications of frustration, like with online, and they can they can uh, look at these statistics. They can see the analytics and the algorithms. It's the abandoned shopping carts. Abandoned shopping carts is the number one because it tells them there was something that made them change their mind. There was something either complicated in the process or something unexpected that came along. And smart companies, and there's a lot of very smart companies, they're they're taking that data. They're analyzing. They're looking at the entire customer journey. Where are we losing people, right? How long are people on a page? So there's, it's very sophisticated now. I think we have more information than we ever have. And that's a great thing. I remember my early days of marketing, we used to say that I know that half my advertising dollars are wasted. I just don't know which half, right? Today we know. Today, today with geotagging, with, I mean, you could literally advertise through, through Facebook, through others to a specific conference within a specific city block and only people in that block will see your ad on Google or others. It's an amazing time. We just have to be really smart about how we do it. But so, um, yeah, go ahead. So my beginning teaser, I mentioned for many of us, just throwing darts at the dartboard. But we're hitting the wall, the window, the back door, but we're not hitting the target. Why are we firing so many blanks today? Because is it technology? We're overwhelmed. Are there too many options now? Why are we doing this? Yeah, I think we're trying too many things. Um, I think most companies are pretty smart. I think the companies that's, that that do well and thrive or survive, I, I think generally, I'm a big fan of, of entrepreneurs and people in business. I think we're pretty good at all of this. Uh, I think there's just some basic things that sometimes we forget because we get a little too familiar and a little too comfortable with the old way that we used to do it. And it worked. 
And you look at the companies that have fallen by the wayside, the Toys R Us's and the, you know, yes. they didn't do anything wrong. They just stopped. They didn't recognize how we had changed, right? What they did always worked. And, you know, you can look at a company like Toys R Us or Bed Bath & Beyond and there. And the reality is we're not struggling to find toys or linens today. <laughs> we just we just found a different way to do it that was more convenient or, or easier. I mean, you it's everything changes. And so it, leaders need to be really on the forefront of how are people buying? What are they expecting? Where, where are their frustrations? What's delaying what they do? Um, and so we, um, I, don't, I don't think they're necessarily just throwing darts, but I think we're overwhelmed. There's always new technologies, there's new social media, and we're trying everything. I always say, look where your customers and clients are. What do they watch? What do they read? Where do they congregate and recreate and dine and connect? Be there. So how you do you do that? You don't how do you know where the fishing pond is? How do you know where they are at? Well, honestly, I don't think it's that difficult. I think if you're very clear on your demographics, we know where people get their information, where they get their marketing or advertising. Um, there's enough firms out there that can help you. There's, uh, you know, I always say, you can watch YouTube videos to learn a lot of that as well. And then, of course, people like us, we are the messengers. We're the teachers. We're sharing new research um, through our books, through our speaking and our consulting. But be hungry for knowledge. What worked three years ago doesn't necessarily work. I don't think there's any shortage of information out there. Just make sure that the sources you're listening to aren't necessarily trying to sell you their platform. So now let's jump into social media. We have become one sure. of the new engines. Is it, is it a GIF or is it a GIF? Is it a, a, a mini movie? What? How, how does social media play into all this now? I think it plays into it with two things. One, what I just said, which was be on the platforms where your customers are. Right. right? And of course, they, they shift over time. You know, the young people fled Facebook because us old people kind of took it over and then they're off to TikTok or Instagram. And there are a few that are very, very effective just you got to understand how they work and you've got to be consistent um, linkedin is of course probably the best for b2b but their algorithm changes all the time because yes. people try to game the system and then we have great colleagues like richard bliss and others who just their job is to stay on top of the algorithms and then i learn from them so i can use it better but um we have never in history had these platforms where we can reach people we just got to make sure that we use use them in the way that works. And, and it's kind of been that way from the beginning is that in, in social media, don't sell, share, right? Be a part of that conversation. Engagement is highly valued by their algorithms. Pick a couple and be consistent, right? Who's getting the eyes and ears and why? And it's not hard to find information that teaches us how to use it well. And then there's a few people that knock it out of the park. You know, if you look at somebody and uh, most old people don't really recognize it as much, but you look at some of the, the brilliance of somebody like Mr. Beast, right? Mr. Beast is Jimmy Donaldson. He's 26 years old. They have 300 million subscribers yeah. on YouTube. And most of their videos get 50, 60 million views yeah. on day one. And I know this because my daughter is creative director and lead producer. <laughs> so i couldn't be more proud i i do something online i get like 10 yes you do yes you i do. get tens of thousands of of views and she goes dad that's awesome i just had one that just passed a billion and i'm like shut up sierra <laughs> <laughs> but they, these they're, they're just brilliant it's but don't throw darts right yeah they're very very strategic it, it's it's a it's a rifle over a shotgun now you do travel the world you're a public speaker, highly recognized, you can't miss you. But during the pandemic, the walls of international came down. We can now talk to anyone instantaneously yeah. like we're doing right now. Yeah, That was a big game changer. But then I talked to a lot of companies that said, oh, thank goodness we're going back to regular business again. And they shut down their virtual world. Why would you ever shut down a gateway like this with a global reach that is endless now and it's free for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not a I'm not a, a fan of shutting anything down. Now that said, I might be a little contrarian that I think we learned very quickly, right? We we got terms like Zoom fatigue yes. very quickly that we know that we need to engage people face to face. 
uh, in person, right? Get our feet under the same table, the serendipity of the unexpected conversations in the hallways. That said, dude, this is magic right now. You and I, for my parents' generation, for our parents, yeah. this is magic. For us, it's Sunday night. Yes. Right? It's 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 amazing that we can do this. I have clients all over the world. And so I have I have conversations virtually every day with clients in, in Singapore and Dubai and Mumbai, India. It's magic and it's amazing, but it's not in lieu of getting together. You know, prior to the pandemic, I did one out of every 10 calls over Zoom. Zoom's not new, right? No. One out of 10. Today, it's 19 out of 20. I, 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 my phone was ringing the other day. We, we got in a new system. I, I couldn't figure out what that sound was. It was the telephone because nobody calls. Right. So the, it's both. And I tell, and I tell audiences all the time, I said, this is a great face to face. We avoid miscommunication. It's another tool. It's so important. But if I will tell you, Rich, if I see, if I'm on a zoom call and I see another palm tree or golden gate bridge, I am going to slash my wrists. Friends, it's been, even since the pandemic, it's been years. Curate a background, learn how yeah. to be good at this, learn how to, to unmute your microphone, but there is no reason to shut this down. Virtual is a phenomenal opportunity to bridge the miles, but it's not in lieu of face-to-face. -face. It bolsters the conversation and enhances our relationships. And you, if you're not good at it by now, you are so far behind the times. Well, and just keeps the ball going. Even if you yeah. go in person, you keep the relationship going through this. And then the next time you meet, you, you're already rocking. So this gap of typing, texting, messages, emails, and then you ha have to catch back up again. Right. It's like just an ongoing thing now. All of the above. All, omni-channel. Every way you can. There's some people who prefer to, to communicate by text. Okay. My kids will do that, but they also do FaceTime. They don't do Zoom. It's fine. I'll talk to them that way. You know, it's it's a it's it's a great time to be alive. It's it's a, it's a stupid time to be resistant. Yeah, it is. Uh, you need to always adapt, always be learning, try something new, try try again. Sure. Now, you do travel globally, and I'm interested in the whole customer experience globally. Yeah. Who's winning in customer service around the world? Who do we need to pay attention to to get that advantage? So there's some pretty universal things worldwide. Um, there's almost a, an, an, a more, um, a greater acceptance of sort of the mobile and the digital. You go to, in London, nobody's pulling out cash for everything. You're tapping your phone on everything. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> right. Restaurants are going on the tube or whatever else. So they're a little bit ahead of us for many of those things, but, but the world is flat and everywhere you go, it's fairly universal. Um, I, I think delivery can in places like India isn't quite as fast, but there's an expectation that we respect speed. There's an expectation of simplicity of process and convenience. Uh, uh, Shep Hyken had a, a great study that talked about, I think the statistic was 68% of people said that they prefer a convenient experience over a friendly experience. Isn't that interesting? It's not to suggest that people don't want friendly. We're fine with friendly. Just don't be friendly and waste my time. Just don't be friendly and tell me no, right? That's where you get scripted response, right? I understand, Mr. Von Trigger, uh, how frustrating that must be. And you're like, don't read the script. Oh, I, 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 yes, Mr. Von Trigger, how it's like, right. don't read the script, just listen to me. Right. Because they're trying so hard to be friendly. And what we really want is not just speed of, of, of connection, we want speed of resolution. So you it resolve? used to be you would walk in the Best Buy. I love Best Buy. My, my car would drive in the Best Buy by itself and I would stop. Right. And say, oh, how did I get here? Right. Um, you know, buying another DV. And, and, and 30 back. years ago, you did the same thing with Radio Shack. Right. Right. Because <laughs> we're those guys. So <laughs> you would walk in and the minute you got through the front door, someone there would greet you. And they were going to walk through the store with you the whole way to make sure you bought something that day. Yeah. Then they changed the policy, hands off. Just keep dusting the stuff and pretend like you're not paying attention and make them come to you to ask the question. Right. Radical shift because we were tired of getting bombarded. Now you're ignoring us. Does yeah. the pendulum swing like that in the customer well, experience? Does it go it, to the extremes? They're all, but they're also struggling with staffing and they're also st struggling with, I think the biggest challenge for companies like Best Buy, and I was that guy forever as well, is that 
one of their biggest struggles is that people are treating them like a showroom. Yes. They're going in there, they're finding something that might cost $1,200. They need to see it, touch it, feel it. They go, this is perfect. They pull it up online and they hit buy as they walk out of the store right. and buy it for $150 less. And so I, I've been asked the question, I don't even know what the solution is for a company like Best Buy because we've changed. There's some people that want to do it in person, but in general, if you can treat it like a showroom, find out what you want and then buy it cheaper, you're going to do it. Um, clothing is one of those things that people that will never, it's never going to be online because people need to try things on. And then Amazon, of course, made it very, very, very easy to return the things you don't want. Right. And so it's, boy, I'm it's- try my shoes. I'm not buying my shoes online. I have absolutely. to try my shoes in person. Absolutely. But, so, but sometimes if you'll, you'll do it the first time and then you'll buy the next pair online. It's the same thing about food. You got to go in and you find the stuff that you like, and then you call up DoorDash and have it delivered forever. We're seeing this with shopping malls coming out of, of the pandemic. I was doing some work with the uh, the Middle Eastern shopping centers and others as well, and they were doing this huge shift. They were doing delivery. They were doing curbside pickup. Uh, a lot of these shopping mall stores and other retail stores were turning their back rooms, um, taking half of their store and turning them into shipping centers. Wow. And accepting the fact that people may come in, want to see it and touch it, and then they would try and play that role of the ones who would deliver. It's all changing. It's important that that business owners, entrepreneurs, others in business, you've got to stay on top of what's happening. Don't chase, you know, um, the newest fads, but be very conscious and don't be so resistant. Find ways to embrace it. Modify how convenient you are. I mean, my whole message today is about looking at every point of contact and saying, how can we simplify it? How can we expedite it? How can we become more convenient and ultimately become ridiculously easy to do business with? Ridiculously easy. I love that part name of the book. Just just, just stick with that, ridiculously easy. <laughs> now, we've been talking about the competitive advantage. I want to go back to an earlier book of yours. Sure. Why Customers Leap. Yeah. Yes. I think that's huge in today's market. They, Retention is a big issue. Done, Fred and the family have always come. And all of a sudden, Fred and the family are gone. Yeah. Why yeah, are um, they leaving? <clears throat> they're leaving for one simple reason. Because they can. Um, retention is not, it, it's, loyalty is not, it's not dead. It's just harder to earn. It's harder to maintain and foster because it's become increasingly easy to leave you. The things that people might put up with, or maybe have to wait a little bit longer, but we really love these guys. Now someone says, you don't have to wait at all, we'll deliver it to your house. And so um, retention loyalty has become very, very difficult. Uh, and so when you look at those little points of friction, of frustration, somebody has a bad experience, they'll go somewhere else just because they can. Mm. Uh, you know, if you're in Disneyland and you'll, you'll pay 20 bucks for a hamburger because you have nowhere else to go, you're inside the gates, <laughs> right? You're captive. And so um, I'll ha I've had really frustrating conversations with my bank. Let's say, no, you have to do it this way. I said, well, I don't have to do business with you at all, right? And so when companies become rigid, where they say no to simple things that they could say yes to, um, it's it, we can leave. Well, David, you've got a great uh, website, and I'm going to bring that up here and let people hit the QR code. Go check out this amazing global speaker highly rated customer service yes, guy. all of those things rich yes what do you have there at your <laughs> website david um if you just go to my website it's just my name david .com. it's just some examples of my speaking i've got books we do consulting of course as well and some assessments but uh i'm just i'm an ambassador i'm a i'm a passionate um uh humorous uh <laughs> ambassador for for great service and for a great experience for your customers and clients so and of course all my books are on amazon online but um, the newest one ridiculously easy to do business with i think you'll like it make sure you check that out again that's been a big part of our conversation here tonight now i've been saving this question for the end here because yes. this is the one that drove me crazy from all my years in retail and marketing and all the other junk of the world but i never believed it so i'm really interested the customer is always blank right uh the customer always deserves to be heard and respected. Oh, instead of the customer is always right? They're not always right. Sometimes they're 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 an ass, but so are we. I mean, we all can be at times, but it, it's it's kind of a overly simplistic way. It's they don't always get their way, but but 
we we do the best we can. We make sure that they're heard. Here's my favorite line. I'll leave this for everybody watching or listening to this tonight. Is sometimes the answer is no. I mean, come on. I mean, if you have a vegan restaurant, somebody wants a buffalo burger. Sorry, dude, that's a hard no. Right. <laughs> Here's the magic response. Here's a huge takeaway. Even when the answer is no, if there's something that we can't do, right? There's something we don't offer or whatever. Here's the response. Let me tell you what I can do. Just that. And anything that follows that that's helpful, let me tell you what I can do. I don't, we don't know when that's coming in, but I'm going to put something on my calendar and I'm going to shoot you an email every morning until we find out what's happening with that. Let me tell you what I can do. We don't offer that, but we've got a strategic partner who I think you would be great to reach out to. They can do it. Instead of saying, no, I'm so sorry, we can't do that. Or, or I'm um, sorry, that's against our policy. Say this, let me tell you what I can do. And then offer something of help and of service. Even if it doesn't benefit you, you've fortified that relationship. David Everin, that's amazing. That's a great mic drop. That's a super way to wrap up our time here today. David, thanks for being my guest. This has been hey, a blast. Friend. Yeah. That's David Averin. You again, you want to go check out the website, make sure you uh, learn about his books, all the other things he's got going on. And again, come back here for another episode of Rock to Stage Show to get amazing insights from these global leaders. He, he's about ready to go to his 28th different country. Got to get a passport. That's one I learned tonight. I got to get a passport. I got to get back on the road and have more fun out there. Don't forget, Sunday night, 7 p.m., we have another great conversation. We're traveling the world with celebrities, actors, writers, global experts of all different types and bringing you the best of the best. Get ready. We got some more coming from the opposite side of the world. We are going to travel the world right here on Sunday night, coming up very soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Add your comments, your thoughts, your questions. And, of course, join us on PPN, the Public Place Network, where we are traveling around the world in 17 different countries right now and expanding more and more. And that's going to do it for tonight. I'm the Trigger Rich Bontrager. Have a great week. We'll see you right back here, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Rock the Stage Show.